Prime Minister Modi issued a statement. We support the Palestinian cause. We support the two-state solution. It is the one country which has suffered from terrorism forever. India is one country which is widely trusted by Israel and widely trusted by the Palestinians. The UN is trying to do what it can, but you know, wherever the interests of the superpowers are involved, then UN True. is defunct. True. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of divided opinions about the ongoing crisis between Israel and Palestine. Having said that, on behalf of Diary for Publisher, I would like to re-emphasize the fact that we need to stick together in these difficult times. That is why I bring to you Ambassador Anil Tregunayat, the Indian Ambassador to Jordan, Libya and Malta, with over 30 years of experience in the subject of Western Asia. I couldn't think of anyone better to discuss the crisis with. Without further ado, let's hear more on it from him. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being here, sir. I really appreciate that. Pleasure in my show. Thank you. So, could you please fill the audience with the, the crisis that's ongoing and the, the, the problem that started way before? Number one, uh, the worst thing about this crisis this time is that we had a terror attacks which killed about, so far, 1400 civilians who are Israelis mostly. And this has never happened there. The second uh, differentiating dimension of this Hamas attack was that it was done in a, such a meticulous manner that it was able to bust the myth that Mossad is the most strongest spying agency, the Shin Beth is strong, the, uh, the Israeli army is the strongest army in the, one of the strongest army in the world. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, they were all caught unawares mm -hmm. and which is a very major uh, challenge for them. And subsequently, Israel as usual, what it does, it has started bombing Gaza which is a very small strip of about 300 odd square kilometers. So people can't go very far. And uh, there are ordinary people who are living about 2.3 million population of Gaza. And if the bombing happens, and it's the most densely populated region in the world. Before we define Hamas, let us go back to the 19th century. The First World War, Ottoman Empire was disintegrating. The Britishers <coughs> were there. And then they got the mandate. But before that, the British Foreign Secretary was Mr. Balfour. And he wrote a letter to Mr. Rothschild. And this letter is merely 67 words, in which he says that we will get a home for Jews. The Britishers got the mandate of the Palestinian region right. in 1923. And since then, um, in 1948, when the mandate ended, they were given a choice by the United Nations that there can be a two-state solution. One is Palestine, the other will be Israel. Israelis accepted it and declared their own state. Palestinians said, no, it is our land. You have brought people from all over, inhabited them in our area, and therefore we will not agree to this. Instead of agreeing, they launched an attack. The states of Transjordan, which is there, then Egypt, Syria, Iraq. But the Israelis in the process fought back because they were fighting for the survival. And they even captured some of the territories. And then, then again, after some time, 1967, another attack happened, Six Days War. And during the Six Days War, Israel convincingly defeated all these Arab countries and acquired Gaza, which is today. Then they acquired the West Bank, which was with uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. They controlled the whole of Jerusalem. But in 70s, we saw 79, that Egypt normalized relations, signed a peace treaty with Israel, which was a very important thing, actually. And they got the land back through that? They well. got some land back from Sinai in that process. And then... Every time there was something happening, then we had these Madrid, Madrid discussions, Madrid meetings. Then we had the Oslo Accords. During the Oslo Accords in 93, which just completed 30 years, it was agreed that a state of Palestine mm -hmm. will be recognized by the Israelis and the Palestinians recognized the existence of the state of Israel. So there was a mutual recognition and then they got some land. Uh, where Palestinian Authority, earlier Yasser Rafat, their leader, 
PLO. He was heading the Palestinian Liberation Organization. By the way, even PLO was treated as a terrorist organization before at that time. But after the Oslo Accords, the legitimate discussions started happening between them. Gaza was controlled and eventually in 73 war, another war happened. And then Israel continued to control Gaza till 2005. But it was impossible for them to do so. The people were still fighting and there was, you know, yes. Finally, they decided that we must quit. So they left Gaza. And Gaza is a very small territory which goes into the Sinai and through Rafah border connects with Egypt and northern part of Israel, the southern Israel and northern part of Gaza. And there have been four wars since then between Hamas and uh, the uh, Israelis. First war was 2008-9, second war was 2014, last one was 2021, and then now in 23. In all these wars, what we have seen is Hamas, which is uses militancy and terrorism as a means to achieve its goal of the Palestinian state. And so naturally it wants the decimation or finish completely eliminating Israel as a state. So that's the their declared position. On the other hand, the Ramallah-based government of Palestine, led by Mahmoud Abbas, who works in collaboration with this, but his authority has been completely decimated. So he is not in a position to really do much about it. But the cause of Palestinian state remains because that is still very much relevant to the psyche of the ordinary Palestinian and consequently of the Arab world. Now what we are seeing is that more and more countries in the Arab world are beginning to normalize ties. After Egypt, it was Jordan, Mm -hmm. which had normalized ties in 94, signed the peace treaty. And Jordanian king is the custodian of the Al-Aqsa Holy Mosque in Jerusalem. The current government of uh, Netanyahu is ultra-rightist government, as you know. So they don't believe in acceding anything to the, or conceding anything to the uh, Palestinians. They continue to defile and desecrate the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, those visuals very often not only bother the Palestinian, but the Islamic world. And so it becomes a major challenge for the international community and for the Arab world to continue to normalize ties with Israel while that all that happens. Right. Hope for them was that someday Israel will understand and there will be a mutual accommodation and Palestinian state, two-state solution with 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as capital will be established. So that is the game that continues. Today in the in this war, which is very unfortunate, thousands and thousands of people have been killed. Israel uses force to protect itself. It has excelled in technological dimensions. Yeah. It is one of the strongest states, nuclear state mm-hmm. in the region. It follows the policy of offense is the best policy. But that has not worked. Obviously, as what we are seeing, the result, the outcome is entirely very different. So where should we go from here? There will be, let us say, they want to punish, decimate, destroy Hamas. Very difficult to do that. But they will do it. It is their right to defend themselves. They might go in. But the rules of war clearly say that the civilian population, hospitals and others, UN organizations, should under no circumstances be targeted. The Geneva Mm -hmm. Conventions on that. The violations of those that happen or is happening, happens every time. Now, Hamas is at one time was supported by Israel also because the Israeli government, including Prime Minister Netanyahu, they want, they did not want a two-state solution. So, they did not want a Palestine, unified Palestinian movement. So, they created this another thing, which then opposed the authority in Ramallah, correct, the divided house. And that is their biggest plight because they remain divided till today. So today Hamas has become far more popular in the region because it is seen as somebody who is really pushing for the cause of Palestine. Right. So the results of this uh, current war was that Palestine achieved certain results. Now what are those results? Number one is 
it has been able to kill the maximum number of uh, israelis highest number number 2 visually it can seem that they were able to penetrate some 30 odd kilometers within the country for the first time in the history with all kind of impregnable right. uh, resources being there third is it was able to stop for the time being normalization of ties between saudi arabia and israel and other arab countries so it has achieved a certain result from its perspective now what happens is israel will take its own punitive measures and it will try to 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 really get the 200 odd israelis released who are the hostages there now hostages are a very major issue and that's a negotiating leverage also for the hamas right so it will try to extract the mileage that it wishes to so do you see this war as a political war or more like a religious aspect it's i think combination of both and it's a combination of survival mm -hmm. there's a war for survival both for the israelis and for the gazans or palestinians because see the thing is that israel has a force most modern army hamas and the palestinians they are fighting for the cause of their land so it's a political fight it is also religious because the both the religions are part of the abrahamic religions islam and judaism yet they right wingers in that feel that there is no scope for the other to survive and they demonize one another so that is another very major problem in this so do you see this situation as something which is brewing because of the extremists at both sides to some extent yes this was not always extremism as it is as i said it, it was uh, hamas started only in 1987 mm -hmm. but this problem of the palestinians of course has been an ancient problem it's very as i said 1917 on if 1948 let us say palestine had agreed to two state solution they would have their own state israelis would have had their own state again in oslo accords there was a discussion on this mm -hmm. but what is happening is that israel has continued to create new settlements in the palestinian territories in the west bank and that is something that is going to be a permanent problem that means that the original premise on which it was agreed that two state solution will happen mm -hmm. on the 1967 borders are virtually unachievable today israel is unlikely to vacate any of these or give it away but israel also wants uh, to have good relations with the arab world because its major enemy in the region is iran Iran Saudi Arabia and other countries are now normalizing ties Israel normalized ties with Sunni Arab states what we are looking at is that Iran by its proxies like the Hamas like the Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria and like Houthis in Yemen the three edge it is able to exercise a tremendous influence in the Arab world it is a Shia Sunni Shia yeah. country but in the Sunni Arab countries it is able to manage those through these entities so it supports them of all the countries that supported in the first instance everybody nobody liked what hamas did right because it could have provoked a war or something like that but at the same time because there are more and more civilian casualties that are happening in gaza the public sympathy is moving towards palestine so i think that this is a a dangerous uh, situation that is developing because if hezbollah from lebanon side starts attacking iraq israel saudi so the iraqis they have militias there so from syria if, from all these angles it happens so it will be difficult for israel so i've been seeing a lot of people you know supporting each sides on basis of what what's happening right now but don't you think it is important to understand the historical uh context how did it start and where did it come from and why is it happening now or what is happening and people don't understand that what is your take on that well i will answer this question in the form of india's official foreign policy mm -hmm. because that will that should give the idea exactly where we stand mahatma gandhi way before independence independence said that like the england is for the british france is for the french Palestine is for the Palestinians. 
that has defined India's policy. It was also defined pro-Arab mostly because we have very close relations with Arab countries, historic relations. We are dependent on the oil on them, then gas, our energy security depends on that. There are more than 9 million people there. Our trade, everything transits through the Hormuz and the Suez Canal. India also helped most countries become independent from the colonial yoke uh, in the non land era. So our policy was guided by that. And that policy was very clear that there should be a two-state solution. Initially, we did not recognize Israel in 1948. Right. It was only in 1950 that India recognized but did not establish full diplomatic relations. We allowed a consulate to be opened in Bombay for Israel to render services to the Jews and others. It was only in 1992, and I happened to be handling that in the Ministry of External Affairs at that time, mm -hmm. when we decided to upgrade our relations because Arab world, Palestine itself, were talking to Israel. And therefore, India said that we are going to also normalize this. And we normalize relations. Today's situation is that our relations with Israel are very strong. They are strategic partners. In defense and security and agriculture, they are very close to us. They support us against terrorism all the time, mm -hmm. whenever there is an issue. And India is the one country which has suffered from terrorism forever. At the same time, we have developed a very close relationship with major Middle Eastern countries. Right. I always say that under Prime Minister Modi, this government, the biggest achievement, and which I wrote in this book also, is the success of our West Asia policy. But I also feel that we should be doing a little more than simply in the bilateral format or issuing statements and all. Now on the Samas thing, we dehyphenated our relationship. For example, now we say that our relations with Israel are on their own. Our relations with Palestine are on their own. We support the Palestinian cause. We support the two-state solution. We are staying side by side. We support the peaceful resolution of the conflict. This is India's position. For the audience, I would like to say that we must clearly look into this. For example, when the Hamas attacked, Prime Minister Modi issued a tweet. In his tweet, he clearly said, condemn these attacks. Horrific attacks. Everybody would when right. the civilians are targeted. We have suffered from it. We know it. And that India has expressed a solidarity with the Israeli people. Nothing wrong with it. Two, three days later, <clears throat> the media people asked the spokesman. He reiterated India's stand on Palestine, which is a long-standing one. There is no change in that. That there should be two-state solution. And then, day before yesterday, when the a bomb on this Al Ali hospital happened. 500 people, nearly 471, were killed. Prime Minister Modi issued a statement commiserating with the uh, with the people of uh, Gaza, Palestinians, and said that the responsible people must be brought to the book. So that's a very matured way of handling a growing crisis, right? By taking a principled position. That's what precisely India has done, and I think our uh, viewers must look at it in this context. When I see uh, Hamas, for instance, or Israel, for instance, both are right in their own own terms. The only thing which is not right is the violence. But they are fighting for their own right cause, right? If, if for example, if we were in place of Israel and we were attacked, our response would have been an attack as well to to defend ourselves. But of course, Hamas is attacking for their own land. Hamas is trying to protect his, their Palestinian people. We can't say who is right or wrong here. What What do you think about that? Well, we don't say who is right or wrong. We understand that Hamas is ruling uh, Gaza. It was also elected 2006, uh, uh, but it did not get the power to this because of the opposition of Israel and Western countries. But the fact is, what are the means deployed to achieve an objective? Now, if Hamas thinks that by using bombs, by killing people, by this, they are going to achieve a state, I think they are living in a fool's paradise. It is not going to work. Rather, they will oppose. So today, except Iran, no other country in the Middle East, no Arab country likes this kind of thing. Because it can attack you tomorrow. <clears throat> it will inflict the same kind of thing on another country, whichever is 
doing it. On the other hand, I would say that Israelis also will have to come out of their complete, utter security mindset. That using force is the only thing that can yield a solution. It's not possible. It has not succeeded so far and unlikely to succeed in future. Mm -hmm. So means to an end are also equally important. So if there is a possibility, if there, but what Hamas is, did was wanted to do was that people forgetting the Palestinian cause. Support was getting less. Okay. There was a Palestinian fatigue that was happening. So by doing this act, they have brought it back into the focus. They will no doubt lose. They will no doubt kill. Lo- kill a lot of people will be killed. They are yeah. no match to a proper army in this case. But gorillas are gorillas. You know, we have right. seen in every war, uh, gorillas often have an undue advantage. So, if you were to we were to go ten days back when the war started, what could Hamas have done in a sustainable way? What can they do to support the Palestinian situation? The first thing the Hamas has to do is sort out the differences with Palestine. Leadership. So that they both become part of the one thing. There were supposed to be elections in 2020. They had agreed at one time. Hamas was very sure that they will win all the elections again. That time Mahmoud Abbas said no, if there is no voting. Israel said that we will not allow voting in the East Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the part of Palestine. But since Israel is controlling it, it said no, we will not allow anything. Uh, no voting in this. So this kind of a complicity to defeat a democratic process. In my view, is the biggest hurdle to normalization also. And then, as you said, is that sometimes they think, they thought that they have no other option. Mm-hmm. So, you without accept using violence. But this is not now. They have done it in four wars. Every time more Palestinians have died. True. More people, innocent people have been killed by their acts. I would say the Hamas will be forced to give some kind of a justification to its own people for what is happening to them. You see, cause is there, but the, the means uh, deployed have to be, of course, incommensurate with that. And even now, there is, I don't see as a diplomat, I always feel that there is, it's not lost forever. Provided there are right interlocutors, the countries that can help, who have genuine interest of both Israel and Palestine in mind, can work together to bring about some kind of a solution to this problem. So, you're someone who's closely seen both Israel and Palestine as well. What kind of problems do Palestinians face from Israel? Well, number one is the land. I mean, they don't have a state. Mm -hmm. They fail persecution. They feel that they are discriminated against. They don't have the same opportunities. They are not masters of their destiny. They have to depend on Israel. They don't have an airport. They don't have a seaport. They have no exit. All their security is covered by Israel. So it isn't that they have an enclave. Then their land, which traditionally belonged to them, their uh, their mosque uh, and the religious places, they are all being violated. So obviously, I mean, this is something that tend to affect them. It has become far more in the recent past with the new government, which Benjamin Netanyahu, who has been in power for 20 years. In Israel itself, there are a lot of divisions today. Political divisions are tremendous. Uh, I feel that uh, Netanyahu is on a weak wicket at the moment. Yeah. Yes. Someone who has uh, been in West Asia a lot, what would you say is a, would be a sustainable uh, way forward from this war? Well, I think once this war is over, in my view, we should have some other actors which are trusted to help bridge the gap between the two sides. It will be extremely difficult. Extremely difficult for the simple reason because the 1967 borders no longer exist. Theoretically, even the state of Palestine idea may exist, but in reality, it will be extremely difficult to get that. So, because Palestinians, if they are there to, okay, we want this, this, this. Israelis will not vacate it. So, it's a non-starter from that point of view. Therefore, there has to be a lot of soul searching on both sides now. Moderate elements in Palestinian movement, Arab countries, the Israelis must think that whether peace is better or a constant state of war and threat. 
Now I, I have recently written about it also and have proposed India is one country which is widely trusted by Israel and widely trusted by the Palestinians. So can India take the lead? There is a hesitation because of failure. Now people say, but diplomacy, there is no failure. There is an incremental achievement. Let us look at it that way. If you don't try, you're not going to get that. So somebody has to try. And India is a power to reckon with. What we have done in G20, the kind of standing we have globally for peace, dialogue, diplomacy, the stand we took on Russia-Ukraine war, it all points to the direction that where there is a requirement in this region, because it is the most important for us, as I said, for economy, for energy security, for our people. Then it is incumbent upon us to take some action, to try to broach the idea. And I'm quite sure India will be acceptable to both sides. And I have also written that in case, suppose we say, okay, alone we can't go, we don't go and all. Let's have a quartet kind of thing. So I suggested three, four countries. Saudi Arabia, it's a custodian of two holy mosques, virtual Islamic leader in the world, richest economy, most powerful economy, biggest country and all. Second, you have Egypt, another old power, have a special relationship with Israel, had a peace treaty with Israel, controls Ramallah, is against Hamas, not in favor of it. Third country, I said, is Brazil. Brazil is a Latin American country, way off, is part of the United Nations Security Council, is going to be the next G20 member, uh, president. So all these four countries have stakes in the region mm -hmm. and they have certain credibility to not necessarily the Israelis will accept this or that, but they want close relations with them, with Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is the biggest catch for them. And that was the biggest fear for the Hamas and Palestinians, that if Saudi Arabia normalizes their relations, Palestinian issue is dead. There is nobody left to talk about Palestine. So I think that this is something that we could try to do at the moment. Anyways, if we don't do it, at least let the countries in the region try to do, rather than demonize Israel. Israel is a reality. It is a state. It yeah. has to exist. It has a certain things which it can share with these countries, which was clearly seen in the I2U2. Mm -hmm. so UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco and Sudan normalized ties under Abraham Accords. India, UAE, uh, USA and Israel are a partner in the I2U2. There is the IMAC. All these initiatives are dead now. I mean, or at least put on hold for some time. So I think that if we don't do anything about it, if Israel does after again like last previous times, again maybe it decimates Hamas to some extent, it goes into ground offensive, let's say. Outcome, they may declare victory one day. Mm -hmm. Then what? Where do we go from there? Most important thing is to arrive at a certain solution. And I don't know what solution now it will be. It can be one state, two state, three state or whatever it is. But whichever solution they adopt can help establish some peace in the region. Do you think the situation has the capacity to escalate? Yes. And turn into a World War Three as well? Not World War Three, I would say, but it definitely can be a very major regional confrontation. Mm -hmm. Because Iran is there to support Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, U.S. is there to support Israel and the Western countries. And if that continues to happen, the more casualties, more dangerous, then we might have this spreading into the region much faster. Right. United Nations was formed up after World War II. Mm -hmm. What is their uh, response in, in this situation? Well, the UN is trying very hard. UN Security General has been asking, Secretary General has been asking for uh, cessation of hostilities, some kind of ceasefire, provision of the humanitarian assistance and relief supplies and all. Uh, it's not happened. On the other hand, there were uh, U Russia and UAE piloted one of the draft resolutions uh, for ceasefire and uh, supplies of uh, resources, uh, relief supplies, which has also been shot down by the Americans. Uh, Brazilian, uh, another uh, draft resolution was there, which has been shot down again by US. So. UN is trying to do what it can, but you know, wherever the interests of the superpowers are involved, then UN True. is defunct. True. True. So this situation that we're seeing at right, right now, 
India has also been through a situation like this as a partition with India Pakistan. What is our learning from this kind of situation now? Well, our learning was that we want to want well for Pakistan. We are not the ones who went to war with them. When Israel was formed, you know, at that year, this is the Pakistani uh, militia groups which came into India and Kashmir and tried to take control of the Kashmir because things were divided at the time. Uh, and then they occupied a certain part of Kashmir, which is called Pak occupied Kashmir. And then part of it in 1960, they even gave to China. On top of it, what they have done is they have started uh, since last 40 years or rather used terrorism as an instrument of their foreign policy. So what India did was India has to protect itself. So it is protecting itself. We are not talking to them. We say we will want to talk to you. Stop the terrorism. Bring those people to this. So I think that that is there, but you can't compare the two sides, two, two things. They're like apples and oranges. Uh, Pakistan was created out of India. Whereas in the other side is the Palestine was a state at the time and Israel was created out of that. Although historically they claim that this land all belonged to them. So the historical uh, accounts can be debated and disputed forever. Uh, it's not going to give you anything except some uh, mental justification uh, for these things. But they don't hold, hold good in the modern international law. So we have to go by what the law says today. So at the end of the day, India also wants peace with its neighbors. It is not that we, this, we are the first one to want peace, but we don't want peace when terrorism is staring into your face. So as long as Hamas does not recognize Israel, mm -hmm. we don't have, they don't have to talk to Hamas. But ironically, at one time, they are the ones, as I said, supported Hamas to become this big. Yeah. You know, I mean, I always tell the people who are in our neighborhood and elsewhere that don't forget in Hindu legends, we have a story of Bhasmasur. They must read it. They must learn from it that if you are going to nurture the terrorists or these kind of people, extremists, they are eventually going to bite you. As simple as that. Lovely, sir. Thank you. Uh, before we finish our conversation today, can I request you to talk about your book, which you, which you edited, Evolving Security Dynamics in West Asia? Uh, well, Shum, thank you very much and for publishing it also. West Asia is my area of tremendous interest and I had published with in collaboration with Vekananda International Foundation. We had some excellent authors mm -hmm. from Israel, from Arab world, from USA, from others who have contributed to this. Excellent chapters and several Indians also from defense point of view, strategic point of view. Because see, the thing is for us and I often believe that West Asia is even more important to us for obvious reasons, for our own security and good well-being than the even our immediate neighborhood or any other country. This relationship is very important. That's the reason I propagate that India should take some lead in bringing about peace there because the stability and security of West Asia is very important. And that's what precisely is the message of this book. Right. Yes. So as a distinguished diplomat, I've got two personal questions for you. Please. Number one is, what is one book in the field of geopolitics or otherwise you wish would have read earlier in life? Me? Yes. That has changed your perspective in terms of diplomatic relations, in, in terms of geopolitics or even life for that matter. You see, the irony of the Indian foreign policy is that a lot of it is based on the Western writings. We don't have an originality about uh, Indian uh, international relations perspective. But we have a history of that. History is the first diplomat, the biggest diplomat, I would say, was Hanuman in Ramayana, then Angad, <laughs> and then we had Lord Krishna in Mahabharat period. And then you have Hotelyazad Shastra. I had not read Shastra before. I have read commentaries over it. I am not so good in Sanskrit. But I think that that is one book which you read again and again. Gita and Sanskrit. Or Gita and this. I think you will know much better how to appreciate it. And I am glad that uh, our current foreign minister 
Dr. Jay Shankar has written his book, The India Way, in which he has taken these from the Mahabharat period. So I think that we have enough repository of geopolitical thought because see, everybody came to India. All the, the invaders came to India because it was the richest country in the world. We gave 27% of GDP and whatnot in the world at the time. We were a maritime nation. We were creating finest Muslim and all. So India excelled in intellectual thought. And the West Asian scholars were the ones who took our knowledge and disseminated to the West. So you don't really have much to learn from them except their craftiness. As I was telling you earlier, the problem, whether it is in India and Pakistan, whether problem in Palestine, these are all the creations of the British. Right. So what can you learn from them? Divide and rule. That's all. I must tell you, sir, this question that I asked you, I asked a lot of my guests. And so many of them have answered that the Gita is one book that they wish would have read earlier. Uh, as a diplomat for the last 30 years, sir, what is one um, thing you would tell your younger self? Well, I will tell them a lot of things have changed <clears throat> and diplomacy also. But the basic quest of diplomacy is always having good relations with the country. Mm -hmm. Advance your country's national interest, be it in the conflict zones or be in the comfort zones. So it's extremely important to be prepared for it. You have to be outgoing. You have to be appreciative and you have to be a good listener. That's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You. Before we go, can I request you to sign me oh, your copy of your book? My pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you Thank so you. much, sir. Thank, Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to like, share and subscribe. Until then, keep reimagining yourself and know that the power of change lies within you.